Welcome to The Leader's Mindset, where we highlight incredible professionals like this episode with entrepreneur and community builder, Dave Berlin. Now we filmed this episode in April, 2023, and a lot has changed. I've rebranded my company, and Dave has gone on to take on some additional roles in the community where he's having an even bigger impact here in Las Vegas and beyond. We wanted to bring you this episode anyway because the lessons that Dave had for us were so powerful, we just couldn't help but share them with you. Thanks for watching and enjoy the episode. Welcome, I'm Jason LaDuke, founder of Evil Genius Leadership Consultants. We're here at Cooperate at Blackfire, who's been kind enough to let us use a small corner of their space as a studio to do some interviews with some fascinating, intriguing, and impactful people in our Las Vegas entrepreneurial community. And today I have with me Dave Berlin, who I don't even know how to describe you with a title, Dave. So why don't you tell us how you describe yourself (laughs) when it comes to a title? Uh, It's changed a lot over the years, but mostly when people ask me what I do, I just say a lot. A lot. (laughs) And and you do. And I I think I'm going to try in the time we've got today to get into not just all of the things you do, but why you and the teams you build around you are so impactful to our many, many different communities here in Las Vegas. So, so before we get into that, let's talk about little Dave (laughs) growing up. Where did little Dave grow up? Yeah. I grew up in a small town outside of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, It's called Pryor. And if you wanted to get really nerdy about it, it's called Pryor Creek. Um, I think the population is about four or 5,000. It might be uh, more than that now, but I think there was like 90 or 100 kids in our graduating class. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that's where I grew up as a a young little Dave. I actually did go by David back then, uh, and then I changed it when I got hip. When you got hip. I was going to say, there's got to be a story behind that, but clearly you got hip, (laughs) and now you are Dave Berlin. And David Berlin had his sights set on something broader, grander, higher yeah. than Pryor Creek. Yeah. What came next? You know, I, if I really went back that far and as soon as you, as soon as I said Pryor, Pryor Creek, one thing that really stands out that's still very prominent in my life is uh, the great thing they did have there was a skating rink. And I had no idea how much music would be a part of my life now mm-hmm. uh, as a, as a wedding DJ. But also it's, you know, everything that I do in the world of entertainment and DJing events, that's what funds all my passion. So in almost every time I get behind the decks and do any kind of event, there is a little Mm -hmm. nod back to uh, little David uh, at the skating rink. So that's a big piece of that. But I think as I learned more about the world, that's where I I definitely knew that I I needed to pack up and and go somewhere else. So... Did little David carry the boom box around with him? Because what if you don't know Dave, Dave pretty much brings his boom box everywhere he goes. Yeah. And it's a lot of fun. And it's a great conversation piece. But. So the, uh, we're going to go ahead and hit it right now. The boom box and, and everything that you've known about the boom box. And uh, for people that do know, I have four, actually, uh, four boom boxes. But that was the very first one that I bought as an adult. I bought right before I went on deployment mm-hmm. for 9-11. So we were we left in August of uh, 2001 when I was in the Marine Corps. Yeah, and so let's, I, get, let's go back to that. Yeah. Let's, let's get into the joining the Marine Corps and, and all that good stuff. Yeah, um, that came much later in life. I mean, that was, that was one of those things. I was at-risk youth, and for that, it took me a while to really figure out what I wanted to do. That was the, when I went to the Marine Corps, that was the first plane ride of my whole life. Mm-hmm. I never really went anywhere, hadn't traveled, you know, everywhere we traveled was by car. Um, so that came much later in life. Uh, I was, I say much later in life, I was 19. Um, but that was really after I'd kind of exhausted everything to figure out where I fit. Um, I, I'm a typical entrepreneur mm-hmm. <laughs> in that, uh, I'm a high school dropout. I didn't, I didn't graduate high school. Um, so the Marine Corps was that solution for me to be part of something bigger than myself and also see the world in a way that I'd never seen it before. 
Now, now I have a question for you about you. You mentioned be something bigger than myself. Mm -hmm. And I think all of us who have served as veterans look back on our time and realize that was a great benefit. Was that why you got into the Marine Corps? Or uh, because in my case, I got into the Air Force because I wanted to fly in planes and see the world and like all the all the wrong reasons to go do it. But I stayed because was doing really impactful things and being part of something bigger than myself. If I had to be really honest, joining the Marine Corps was just a way to get out of Mm -hmm. Oklahoma. (laughs) Uh, I didn't know how much it would affect me until I got there, until I became a part of that. But but yeah, I think that the initial way was just like, I've got to do something different. So I just had to get the heck out of town. That's awesome. Yeah. So you've arrived at the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. Where'd you do boot camp? Uh, So I did boot camp in MCRD San Diego. Okay. Uh, so West Coast Marine, uh, Hollywood Marine, as some people uh, <laughs> colorfully put it. Um, and then from there, I did all my time right there at Camp Pendleton. Uh, so I was part of 1st Battalion, 1st Marines. And what was interesting is I went in January 2000, so pre-9-11. Mm-hmm. And I got out uh, post-9-11, but we happened to be on uh, the 15th Mew at the time. Uh, like I said, we had left that summer of 2001. Uh, had no idea uh, that what we were in for, um, and I did. I did a TED talk about this, uh, TEDx talk later about this in life. Um, it was actually my birthday, September tenth. Mm-hmm. So I was in Darwin, Australia, um, doing what any just turned twenty-one year old Marine would be doing. I, I've I've been to Darwin, so yeah. I know what there is to do in Darwin, yeah. Australia. Um, and we were out partying, and then we got called back to the ship. And honestly, I thought everything was a. Uh, I thought it was a drill because that was our first international port of call on that on mm-hmm. that deployment. So I'm like, really, a drill on our first on our first port of call? And then it was a very sobering experience when we got back to the boat and kind of saw everything that was going on. And uh, I had no idea how much everyone's life would change from that moment. Yeah, yeah, it was a it was a big deal. I remember the one thing I will never forget about that day. I was stationed in Boston. And I will never forget how blue the sky was that day in Boston. It was one of those perfectly clear fall days. Yeah. So so blue it kind of hurt your eyes. Yeah. And that t- till my last day, that is, I will never forget that about 9-11. Wow. It's powerful. All right. Well, that was heavy. Okay. <laughs> so what did you take away from the Marine Corps yeah. that helps you now with all of the many things you have going on now? There's, there's a couple things that that I think carry over into civilian life. And that's, that's a huge passion for me, right? Is veteran transition. Mm -hmm. Um, one is organizational structure. I think there's a lot of organizations that can learn from the military and how to implement communication and leadership structure into their organizations. But more important than that, and it's something that really has played a strong, significant value in my life, is values and and really understanding how if you have a strong set of core values, that can be be a magnet for people to come to you, or but it can also repel people away that don't believe in the same things that you believe. Um, there's a lot of playful banter between all the military branches, mm-hmm. uh, but there's just an an unspeakable bond that normally happens whenever you have two Marines that connect for, for whatever reason. Um, so, um, there's lots of that in every branch or every organization that people have been a part of. Uh, but I think that's one of the biggest things that I still carry over and, and help people with in their organizations. Yeah. The, the shared values we have, we have our rivalries across the service. We see that at right. veterans events here in town, <laughs> but, but when it's on, it's on, we all, we yeah. all snap into it and, and it goes and we make it work. And, and I, I agree. I think those, those shared values, uh, have been an, an essential part of military folks becoming great military entrepreneurs and helping build entrepreneurial communities here in Las Vegas and elsewhere. So, there was the Marine Corps. What came next? Because you didn't go right, you know, even though you had an entrepreneurial mindset, you didn't go right into entrepreneurship. Yeah, it, I did what I think, and just to be clear, I was an infantry Marine. So the skill sets that most infantry Marines generally look at are going to be things like law enforcement, mm-hmm. um, security, and, and a lot of the people that I um, served with did do you know some high level executive protection and law enforcement and things like that. That wasn't the route that I went. Uh, the first job I had out of the military was driving a ditch witch. And I was I was on a roustabout crew, which is uh, basically it's oil and gas industry. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I was like bottom of the 
bottom of the rung, right? So I was just driving a ditch witch, digging a, a ditch for 10 miles um, and just... Every so often there, some yeah. engineer would point no over there and... Yeah, no, every, every like two hours I'd have to get off and like knock these big teeth off of it, yeah. uh, put new teeth on it. It was, a uh, it was up in a part of Oklahoma that was like really hard ground. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I could only go like 15 feet an hour. Um, and it would be like, Oh, you just got to go like two miles that way. Uh, so that'd take me like a month. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, that was, uh, that was a really sobering experience because it was like, I was part of this organization and now I'm sitting on a ditch, witch by myself, mm -hmm. you know, smoking, uh, smoking marble reds just kind of just like you did waiting. you did not take up smoke and right. halfway did you <laughs> right you went all the way on yeah, that one. all the way um i haven't smoked in 15 did you, years did you tear though. the filters off to smoke yeah, too? bit them off <laughs> um but no uh that was a really interesting experience because i had all this time to just sit and process um this is way before i found audiobooks or anything like that so i would literally just sit there mm -hmm. with nothing but this rattling noise and just mm -hmm. time to think so uh, definitely a sobering experience as well but I did have I did have a reason why I went back to Oklahoma. Um, there in in what's really unique. But I told you I was in a small town mm -hmm. outside of Tulsa. There's lots of small towns all across Oklahoma. But for whatever reason, my small town uh, there was a youth academy, and it was an at risk youth. Uh, it's called Thunderbird Youth Academy, and it's it's part of a National Guard Youth Challenge program. I think they're in like 30 cities, mm -hmm. uh, 30 states across the United States, but. Uh, Back then, Tulsa was, or I'm sorry, Prior, where I'm from, was one of the first 10 programs back in 1993. And I heard about that place growing up. Like, that's where I thought I was going to have to go because I was kind of at risk youth. Um, so there was something that made me want to go back and serve those kids. And, and while I did it very selflessly, there was a lot of selfish things that I gained from it. Because mm -hmm. when I was talking to them, I felt like I was kind of talking to my younger mm -hmm. self. Uh, but I felt like I could have more of an impact with those kids. And so I did that for, I was, uh, the best way to describe it, kind of the layman's term. I was a drill instructor mm -hmm. for at-risk youth in a residential program. All the kids were high school dropouts. Um, so they were, it was a voluntary role. So it was a very fine line between military and not military. So um, coming from the Marine Corps, especially Mar Marine Corps infantry, uh, I will say they had to put like a little bit, like tighter leash on me. That rein you in a little bit. Yeah, rein me in a little bit. Uh, but overall, um, I was there for seven, seven years. And I think there was like, they gave me a certificate. It was like 3,300, <clears throat> 3,300 kids had come through that program in my time there. Yeah. Um, so I, I wrote all kinds of policies and stuff that helped every, you know, every um, cycle get better. Um, and a lot of those pra uh, practices are still used today. Um, as they've ex expanded, you know, that's what I left there in 2010. Yeah. So yeah. helping others grow yeah. helped you grow. I'm, se I'm sensing a theme here. Yeah. hundred percent. And like I said, it's like, well, what would you, you know, what advice would you give yourself? Like, that's what I was doing is I was giving those kids the playbook that I didn't feel like I had. All right. Don't, don't jump to the questions later. Okay? Oh. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was a phenomenal experience, but um, to be honest, one thing I realized about that role is there wasn't a lot of upward mobility. Um, you know, I got once I got into the supervisor world of that, mm -hmm. there was only five supervisors. Past that, there was one, one rank above that, and yep. then one rank rank above that. And and then when I looked at the the whole like life plan, I was like, is that it? Um, and I don't want to say I had a nervous breakdown, but I definitely mm -hmm. had. Uh, I was questioning what my purpose was and the craziest <laughs> jump was going from uh working on a ditch witch to being a drill instructor for at-risk youth mm -hmm. and then on my 30th birthday i left that program um and i became a wedding dj and now here we are 13 years later uh, i've dj'd 500 weddings all over the united states uh, i've helped grow and scale wedding dj businesses i've consulted people in the wedding industry catering venues, all that stuff. Um, and now that's just a whole different, whole different life, whole different title. So the progression, <laughs> I'm going to have a question here. <laughs> I promise it's coming. Infantry, mm -hmm. ditch, witch, yeah. oil and gas industry, drill instructor for at risk youth, wedding DJ. Yeah. How did we go from <laughs> this path 
to that. So um, there, actually, I left out a title, and I forget about this because it, it was a hard time. Um, so for that seven years that I was at the Youth Academy, I had this really weird shift where I worked for four year, or for like six years, six of those seven years, I worked on the, the weekend shift and I ran the whole weekend shift. So I, I did two 16s and an eight. That was my 40 hours. And mm-hmm. for the state of Oklahoma, it's not a bad, bad gig, right? It was, it's, uh, wasn't a lot of money. Um, 16, but 16 and eight is a pretty good gig. It's a pretty, it's, it's, it's pretty good. Right. And the, the thing about that is like, people were like, Oh yeah, four days off. What are you going to do? It's like, what am I going to do? It's not like I'm just going to go spend money. So I actually worked the last four years at, at that youth Academy. I worked a second job as a, as an electrician. And what I found in that, in that role was, and this, again, this is before I got into like a lot of personal development that mm-hmm. comes with the DJ business. And I, I know we'll get to that, but like, I was just a worker bee. Like uh, when I ran the, the, the youth Academy, I was like the highest ranking person on, on the grounds, normally in charge of like 200 kids, but it was a very high stress, high impact. Like every, every time my, my radio went off, it was normally a fight or a kid wanting to quit. It was always the, these crisis decisions. What was beautiful about the electric thing was I had taken one class for that whenever I was in high school, but it was a way that I could just go release and just, uh, I did have a, my boombox from the Marine Corps. <laughs> I would play music and I would like, you know, get a whole crew pumped up and we would go wire houses or we would wire commercial, residential, whatever, uh, a lot of industrial stuff. And it was just a place where I could listen to music and just think and get the job done. And I didn't have to make any big decisions. It was like, Hey, here's all the stuff you need to wire this job. You got two days, get it done. And it was just a paycheck. But it, the funny thing is, uh, to answer your question, it was, a uh, it was networking. There was a guy that was on our, on our crew. And he said, dude, you're so much fun and you have so much passion. You don't want to do this for the rest of your life. He goes, I have this friend, he owns a DJ business. You should go talk to him. And when I went and met Jason Bailey, um, I had no idea what I was in, in store for, but that guy changed my life. He's the first person that like put a book in my hand mm-hmm. and said, and when I walked into their company culture, uh, DJ connection at the time was like the largest DJ business in the state of Oklahoma. They dominated Tulsa, Oklahoma city. And when I walked into the environment, it was like all these guys in suits. But it was like all this fun, crazy stuff hanging up all over the wall. Everybody's on the phone. Everybody's energetic. There's people doing like, you know, big claps and all that stuff Mm -hmm. like during phone calls. And I'm like, what is this place? Um, And in short, the poetic, this is entrepreneurship. Like this is the heart of it. And that's where I just got hooked. And uh, little would I know that everything that I learned from being a drill instructor, from being in the Marine Corps, um, I didn't understand how much that would carry over mm-hmm. into the wedding industry. Now, it's not a shot at like club DJs and stuff like that. But, you know, if I were a club DJ, I probably would have gotten fights because just when people come up like, I'm, you know, I, li- I like running the show. I like being organized. I like doing that. And it just that's one thing that comes in in handy for not only planning weddings, but executing weddings uh, and all that stuff. It's like seeing the problem before it happens and just being ahead of it. Well, and one of the cool things about being a wedding DJ, when you're a club DJ, you're a club DJ, night in, night out, different crowd, but all looking for the same thing. When you're a wedding DJ, you are making the most important night of two people's lives the most special night they're ever going to have. I mean, that's, there's a lot of, a lot of satisfaction that can come with that besides the money. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I, that's what the purpose was for a long time. And it's like, I, I get to be a part of this, but now as I sit back and I look through all the photos and I see all the videos and like, I look at what I have and how important that is for me, I have a front row seat to love every weekend. And I get to see the, that's going to be the title the of your of book. That. Yeah. <laughs> front, front row seat, row seat to, to love, love. Uh, the second book. That'll be the title of the second, second book. book. All right, so let's talk about what you have going on now. And you can take your pick because I know sure. you got you got a lot of irons in the fire. If you need a list, or I guess you guys are watching, you probably need a list. Or just uh, do the little bullets. You, you have Choice Sound. You're doing podcasts. You're doing coaching. You're involved with Bunker Labs. Mm-hmm. You're involved with Vets and Tech. You're involved with Global Entrepreneur Week. Take your pick. Start sure. where you want. <laughs> what What is Dave working on now? So the uh, I'll this is normally the order that for right now. 
as of this recording, right? Mm. Uh, normally I start with Bunker Labs because that's one thing that I'm very passionate about. Even when I did the TED Talk, which was in 2014, uh, the TED Talk was called um, Discharge to In Charge, right? Bringing the battlefield leadership to the boardroom and beyond. Uh, I thought you would get more points for alliteration. Turns out I only got like 2,000 views, whatever. Um, but I did it. That was my first public talk. Um, at the time, entrepreneurship, veteran entrepreneurship wasn't even a concept, at least one that I had heard of or known about. Um, it came in 2016, two years later, mm -hmm. that I first got introduced to Bunker Labs. There was a guy traveling around. Um, so when I learned about Bunker Labs and I learned that veteran entrepreneurship was a thing, man, I was addicted and I wanted it so bad. And it just turns out that when I moved here a couple years later, one of the first people I met, uh, we, we launched a chapter here mm -hmm. in Las Vegas. Uh, Bunker Labs is uh, in about 30 cities, 30 communities around the United States. Their focus is to help veterans and their spouses start and grow businesses. Uh, so I love the, the business aspect, but I also love the way they include spouses. There's so many programs out there for yeah. veterans, but not so many for spouses. And I think they've actually paved the way to, um, you know, help amplify, or at least other people now consider, you know, including uh, spouses and stuff like that too. Um, so I'm the, the ambassador here, uh, but I've also uh, helped with some programming and stuff like that. And I've been a part of some of the stuff that happens across the United States. That's one that I'm very passionate about. And that's one that I, I love serving. Um, so that's a voluntary role. Yep. I want to, before yeah. we move on to something else, because I'm sure. so, I'm so captivated by your story as a drill instructor for as risk youth. And you mentioned that one of the things you would get called to do is when a kid wants to quit, yeah. you'd be the one who they'd call to come talk to them. Yeah. And, and I want to know what did you learn from that experience about trying to keep at risk kids in this program? How does that help you? with entrepreneurs at Bunker Labs, veteran entrepreneurs, mill spouse entrepreneurs at Bunker Labs, because their days as an entrepreneur, sometimes you don't want to do it anymore. Yeah. No, that's a great point. Um, well, I, the, it was a very personal way that I did that. I had, I had kind of a retention speech, right? But I also, there was a point in my life where um, I was going through some really hard adversities and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I remember it's just like, it's just this little miracle piece of paper that somebody gave me. And it was this poem. Mm -hmm. And the poem was called Man in the Glass. And I'll probably paraphrase this. You've probably seen memes on it and stuff like that. But um, Dale Wimbro is the guy who wrote it. And it's basically, it's you, it's the man in the glass is the man in the mirror. Yeah. And the whole preface of it is like, you, you know, you've cheated. Um, nobody's verdict matters. Nobody's opinion matters. Um, but you're going to live a horrible life if you've cheated the man in the glass. Then yeah. what I would do is I would ask all the questions, right? And try to understand where they were coming from. Sometimes they got a letter from back home that upset them and they were just trying to make a, a very emotional decision. But I would always have them in my office and I had that, that uh, poem hanging up. And I would make that after I was done talking to him and I'd make him, you know, wait until their platoon sergeant would come back and get him. I would have him turn around and face the wall just far enough away that mm -hmm. it's not right in front of their face but I would make them face the wall until their platoon sergeant got there. And then they'd all just kind of get distracted and then they'd look and they'd see that. And I'd notice them kind of read it. And I, I would say eight out of 10 times, they would turn back around, request permission to speak, balling and just yeah. request to go back and get back to work. So I tried to put that perspective on, on mm -hmm. them and um, I, I just want to share, this is a little bit of an offshoot, but it's really important because years later when I was, uh, when I was growing the DJ business, I remember where I was at cause it was in Tulsa. I had opened up the first office down in Dallas mm -hmm. and that was the biggest thing that I'd ever done at that time. Like outside of the, my days in the, as the drill instructor. And I re I was like trying to scale and duplicate that whole operation. I was recruiting my own people. I was doing all that stuff. And this was when Facebook was kind of mm -hmm. really getting uh, big. It was like 2011, right? 2012. And I got a message from a kid and he said, Hey, my name's Justin. You probably don't remember me. I was trying to quit one day and I read this poem that you had on your wall. And he said, I just wanted you to know that changed my life. And now I'm in the air force. I just, I just picked up E4 uh, and I'm starting to lead people. And I think about that day every day. And then I was, it was just this big, like, 
it was this big aha for me. And it's like, I know that I needed to keep doing that in some way, shape or form. Uh, and that's where I just, I kept reading, I kept learning, I kept trying to grow everything with way more integrity than just, you know, a list of, uh, a checklist of to-do items mm -hmm. uh, and calling that scale, right? I wanted, I wanted to, everything that I've touched since then, I wanted it to have more meaning, more purpose. Um, and for lack of a better term, getting customers in any business is important, but I think everybody should have two lines out the door. It's a line of people that can't wait to buy what you have mm -hmm. and a line of people that can't wait to be part of your team. And, and I try to bake that into everything that I do, whether it be the voluntary stuff, um, all the organizations. And I think about that, that note from that kid, mm -hmm. it's what makes it come, come full circle. I love that. And I love how building a team is so important to you because I have observed you doing that on multiple fronts with all of the things you're involved in in town. So what is your approach yeah. to enrolling people in the vision you have for things like Bunker Labs, for things like Global Entrepreneur Week, for things like what we do in the tech community downtown? Yeah. What, how do you get these folks to come along? How do you, what do you do to get them to be that line out the door who want to be on Dave Berlin's team? So I, I stole this from one of the greatest mentors that I've never met. <laughs> uh, Simon Sinek, um, start with why it was very powerful for me. I have some crazy stories about how I'm connected to them. Um, I have met most of the people on his team. I, for whatever reason, I've never talked to him. Um, but, uh, a lot of what he, he wrote stuck with me. I've, I've read all of his books, uh, but I use the framework of his basic understanding of why. Um, and it's too blank. So that blank. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times I can help people discover that in, in a pretty easy, you know, half day thing that I can, I can walk through with people. But the one that has, it's, it's changed for me, right? If you asked me, I think I was on video, uh, very similar to this in 2016. And I said, my purpose is to inspire veterans. So they're successful in their transition from service to civilian life. And they can then inspire other veterans. It's not that I don't care about that anymore, but when I really realize that community building is what I'm, I'm here for, mm -hmm. um, right now, the biggest why for me is to connect the people of our city so we can show the world who we really are. And there's, there's something that people that want to do that, they gravitate. So it, it starts with that. And then it's having a clear path of how I believe we can do it. And normally that comes through some type of an organization that's already done it. Uh, I, I do like to, I, I say I'm a very original thought person, but sometimes to get the momentum that we need, it's to do something that somebody's already done. Right. So when you look at organizations like Bunker Labs that already had a framework and was in 29 cities before us right mm -hmm. now, we're, and then there's now there's 30 and it's and it's easy to, to plug into that system and do it. Same thing for Global Entrepreneurship Week. You know, they're in hundreds of communities all around the world. I saw how powerful that was in Tulsa and I wanted to bring that here because one thing about Vegas is you've got this hodgepodge of all these unicorn, amazing people from all over. Mm -hmm. But some of those people get here and they say, why don't you have one million cups? Why don't they have disrupt HR? Why don't mm -hmm. they have this? Why don't they have that? And for the ones that I care about the most, I want to bring those here. Um, and then slowly, I think we'll see more of those over time. But that's, that's how I get people excited. But, and sometimes that energy runs out, right? And sometimes people just get busy in the day to day. Mm -hmm. But when we have stuff like a finish line for Global Entrepreneurship Week, uh, I think we can get there. Uh, we proved that last year. So... Um, I think that's the best way is having a really strong reason why that's something that people can resonate with and they can still say, you know, me too. I want to do, yeah, me, I, I see that. How can I help? And, and I've seen that happen. Yeah. Uh, I've been part of that myself when we talked about vets in tech last year yep. and you were clearly too busy to yep. bring that to fruition. And, and a couple of us jumped up and said, we'll take this on because we think this is really important to be here. Thank yep. you, Dave, for letting us know it exists. Yep. We've got it from here. And, and the best part about that, and, th and again, thank you for that because I didn't even really have a full understanding of what that might do for our community, but I see it more and yeah. more every day, especially where we're at in the, in the global economy of, of where we sit as Vegas. And, and I see other folks picking up yep picking up some of the roles on Global Entrepreneur Week and the other things we have going yep. in town here. And, and you've inspired them to do that. And yep. I think that's fantastic. All right, let's play a game. <laughs> I'm down. 
Let's play a game. Okay, so we call this game Rapid Response. Okay. And we have a little sub game to this. This one is free response. Okay. So I'm going to ask you a question, open-ended question. Okay. You're going to tell me the first thing that pops into your mind. Okay. Okay. Dave Berlin, this is rapid response, free <laughs> response category. Ready? Begin. A book everyone should read. Gosh, there's so many of them. That's the hardest question to ask me. Okay. We're um, waiting for an yep. answer. Uh, let's go with. Uh, the Infinite Game by Simon Sinek. Good one. Your next vacation. Oklahoma. <laughs> Are you asking me or telling me? <laughs> That's the next travel I have, <laughs> and I'm counting that as a vacation. So Oklahoma. I think we're going to have to talk about what a vacation is. I know. <laughs> Favorite sports team. Favorite sports team. The Vegas Golden Knights. Go Knights, go. <laughs> An important trend to watch right now. A trend? A trend. TikTok. A podcast you recommend? There's two. Okay. <laughs> Tell us The two. Game by Alex Hermosi and You Are the Brand by Mike Kim. Oh, good one. Best pizza? Andalini's worldwide. Okay. Someone we should all be paying attention to? Ooh, Mike Kim. Okay. You Are one. the Brand. Good one. Who are you going to bet it all on to win the World Series this year? Uh, there's a World Series. The World Series already always ha already happened, right? The well, Las it happens Vegas every Athletics. Year. Okay. <laughs> uh, I don't know sports well, and I definitely do not know. That's okay. Baseball. That's a baseball team. <laughs> yeah. You did okay. I'll give you a choice on this one. Okay. Either don't answer yet. Either your get psyched up song mm. or your walk on music song. Ooh, good, good one. Um, you may have stolen that question, but it's okay. I stole all of yeah. these questions. <laughs> um, no, uh, there's there's a song called Champion by Barnes Courtney. That's my, that both walk out and pump up song. All right, awesome. Your biggest influence in life? For, like, to me? To you. Like, person? Whatever it is. Ooh. Um, if I say Roadhouse, that's a whole, like, separate thing. Uh, we'll come back and do that episode <laughs> yeah. another time. But yet, Roadhouse, the movie Roadhouse. The movie Roadhouse. If, if you are not aware of this, if you are not aware of Dave, I believe you can still find this video mm -hmm. of Dave gives a speech on the leadership principles at play in the movie Roadhouse. Yep. I highly recommend it. Yep, I do too. If you don't laugh five times, we can't be friends. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for playing Rapid Response. I love it. Unfortunately, you win nothing. <laughs> However, this was a lot of fun. So. I love it. Let's talk a little bit about the things that are going on here in Las Vegas. Let's start with our veterans community. Yeah. What's great about our veterans community here in Las Vegas? One thing I love about the veteran community here in Las Vegas is they have done a really good job at breaking those barriers of siloed groups. Um, there's, there's a few things that I see that are consistent across a lot of communities around the United States. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about the the big issue, but how Vegas is doing a really good job of it. And this is where I lose some people and some people might get pissed. Can I say pissed? Um, it's, it's the internet. Nobody cares. I think some people get pissed at this. And when I say that not every veteran is suicidal, mm -hmm. not every veteran is homeless, not every veteran needs a job uh, or needs a free thing. There are lots of veterans that are paving the way for, for other veterans visually by um, things like education, entrepreneurship, Absolutely. employment. And the, in some communities, the, it's a one-sided talk. Now, this is a little bit of kind of a deeper talk, but um, I believe that there's two sides of, of military transition. And it's, it's boiled down to post-traumatic stress, mm -hmm. which... Unfortunately, that ends and it ends very badly. And then there's this conversation of post-traumatic growth and whichever dog you feed is going to get stronger. So the more people stand around and talk about a number that impacts veterans and just focus on that number, that number might go up versus going down because mm -hmm. it, it just, it can create a, a really bad cycle. So when I, I bring all that up, when I see the community of Las Vegas, I feel like we have so many programs that are very visible 
so many organizations that aren't just trying to give free things away and they're not doing uh, stuff. They're actually creating programs that are sustainable and that, that promote sustainability among other veterans through that visibility. Um, that's how we, uh, that's how we do this, in my opinion. That's how we win the hearts and minds, and that's how we keep people on the right track. Uh, so what I love about Vegas is there are programs like Bunker Labs. There mm -hmm. are uh, programs that are very visible, like the uh, Southern Nevada Veterans Chamber of Commerce. Mm -hmm. um, all these things that are, and, and even that, even though that's a chamber that has, it does a lot for businesses, it does so much more than that, right? Because they hit on some of those other pillars of education. Um, employment and mm -hmm. things of that nature. So I think uh, what I think Vegas really has the opportunity to model what they're doing and other cities can pick up on that. I mean, um, I know sometimes it's hard to say, but like at the time of this recording, like mm -hmm. I have a big event that I'm doing in, in Oklahoma next month. It is a little lopsided because a lot of like the reason why they brought me out was they're doing you know, this uh, event about raising awareness for veteran suicide. And I said, I would love to come, but only if I can do another event too, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's going to shine a different spotlight um, and educate people about something they might not know about. I, I love how you yes anded them. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And I kind of want to do it my way. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. Uh, both you and I are really passionate about not just our veterans community as veterans, not just our entrepreneur community as entrepreneurs, but the intersection of those. Yeah. And so I love how you brought that up. But going to our entrepreneur community, same question. What's great about it? Yeah. And what can we be doing to improve our entrepreneur community here in Las Vegas? Yeah, the, the thing that I love about the entrepreneur community here is that it's still so early, right? Um, I'm not the smartest person alive, and I'm definitely not the smartest person in Las Vegas because I've only been here five years. Uh, by the way... I always joke and tell people like when I name all the stuff that I do, they're like, Oh my gosh, how long have you been here? I'm like six months. <laughs> uh, but no, I've been here. I've been here for five years. And if I, I think if we were trying to do some of the stuff that we're doing right now with global entrepreneurship week mm -hmm. and all these other things, if we were trying to do this pre COVID, they would have thrown, thrown us out of town yeah. or dropped us off in the lake or something, because it just wasn't a priority for, for Las Vegas. The priority has always been entertainment, um, uh, conferences and, and it, it always will be, but COVID showed this community that they are not immune to being boarded up and shut down. I've heard so many people talk about 2008 and compare them. And it's like, not I, I wasn't here in 2008, even, but they did not, not have the close. whole, the whole strip boarded up. So, um, that's created what I say is an economic heart attack to this, uh, ecosystem. And now they're trying to, to do their like cardio <laughs> Uh, and, and, and mix in vegetables yep. and that's entrepreneurship and these other, you know, springs of life. Um, and then what I, what I love about this community is we're just getting started. Um, we've got more and more people moving here and that, that can be a challenge, but it's an opportunity because we're, we're getting all these people that do come from ecosystems, uh, that are very diverse and, and not, no one's, not everyone's right. Not everyone's wrong, but some of these ideas that take shape. Uh, start to bring everybody together. And I just see a lot of opportunity for us to uh, band together and really do some some major, major stuff. Yeah, it's a, yeah, that marketplace of ideas, you know, there's gonna be there's gonna be some winners out of that, I think. hundred percent. So you know I'm real big on strategy. I'm a big yeah. strategy, big picture guy. You have a million things going on yeah. at a million miles an hour each. Yeah. How do you stay focused on the big picture and what is your strategy mm. for getting all the things? Cause, cause I know you put, I know you put the time in, I know you start every day and turn the crank, but yeah. it's not, you're not just putting out fires every day. You've got a strategy to what you're doing. Yeah. What is that strategy to get all this done? Well, I'll talk about the one for the, the entrepreneurship stuff first. Like I, I try to always have a clear intention at any table that I'm at, at whether it be a round table for the eco, uh, ecosystem development or the city or any of those things. I always try to, I try to listen first, but I walk into it knowing what's, what's my goal. My goal is to connect the people of the city so we can show the world who we really are. And then a lot of times when I see this common thread of everything and I look at some of the other places that I've been, that have already solved that problem, 
how do I solve it for us? And this is where I'm at right now at the time of this recording. Um, I've said it in a couple of city meetings mm -hmm. and, and groups and stuff. And now I, I try to like make that the punctuation on every, on every round table or whatever. And it's, uh, you know, instead of just the same, all right, guys, good luck. See you next meeting. I say, Hey, real quick, uh, just a little idea here. How about before we tear down another casino or another building in this town, which we're, we're going to continue to do, but what if before we do that, we strongly consider creating a focal point center for entrepreneurial research that is a magnet for all of the innovation. Uh, there's other cities that have done this. Mm -hmm. The one that bring, you know, comes, comes to mind first and foremost was Austin, Texas. Yep. When I went to Austin, Texas, um, for a bunker labs event right after our group call for, for global entrepreneurship week, I realized that the same people that run global entrepreneurship week in Texas are the same people that run the capital factory, which the capital factory is an Omni hotel, two towers, one tower is like all the innovation and all that stuff. The other hotels ran like a hotel because there's always people coming there. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, we have that. And if we can do that here in Las Vegas, then, and I, I make the joke because it stands out, like if it was the, the, um, the Luxor, right? If we did that with the Luxor, that would now become an icon for entrepreneurial research. We could get rid of the whole food court and make it, you know, Nevada's largest test kitchen. Mm -hmm. It's still a functional space, but if it's on the skyline, then that shows the world that we're serious about entrepreneurship, just like Allegiant Stadium showed the world that we're serious about sports. And now we have every major sport coming to Vegas and some of them are looking to headquarter here. So if we can do that, like that's, that's the big vision solution and just keep talking around that idea until, um, until something like that, you know, moves us forward. That, that'll be a big step forward for us as a community. Um, so that's strategy. Um, but that's a little bit more of a long-term strategy. That's okay, because yeah. strategy should be long-term, right. right? You know, the big, the big thing is how do you turn strategy into action? Strategy to task, as we would call it in the military, yep. right? But if, if you are just doing a bunch of tasks, if you're only focused on the tasks, you, they start to creep off into just task for task's mm -hmm. sake. Yep. And, and you start going, is that really helping me do this thing? Yeah. So, but I like that. You're always focused on that, and you are not just focused on the outcome, but on those big ideas yeah. like the Las Vegas version of the capital factory right. that could be something that achieves a strategy. And then there would be lots of little tasks that come along with yep, that. Absolutely. So, and again, with all the crazy things you have, I shouldn't say crazy cause they're all, they're all wonderful things, but all the things you have going on, you are, you are getting really good at delegating yeah. a year ago. I wouldn't have said that to you, <laughs> yeah. but I, I've seen you get really good at delegating over the last year. What, how, well, what's your philosophy on delegating? I, first of all, I appreciate that. And as, as a very sincere apology to anyone who I have dropped the ball on because it has happened. I wish I could say that it's been a perfect road. It hasn't. There's been times that I've had to fight for my own economic survival. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that means that I've said yes to something and mm -hmm. I, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. Um, but now I think that, so where that delegation comes in is having an even more crystal clear vision of where I think we deserve to be. And then saying, here are some of the things that we need. And what I've been fascinated by is that there's so many people that are willing to raise their hand or they know the exact person that they can introduce me to mm -hmm. that would love to, to step on board. So, that's been one thing, uh, one of the most challenging things that I see for, for young, especially veteran entrepreneurs, because that's who comes mm -hmm. through our cohorts, is a lot of times, like we give them this platform and this stage when they graduate to say, what do you need? And they'll say, you know, I just, you know, follow our social media and just, mm -hmm. we'd love your support. And it's like, no, you need an introduction to the director of mm -hmm. operations at MGM because your product or service has to do with that. Mm -hmm. like. That's what you need to ask for. And if you ask the right, like for the right thing, people raise their hand and be like, oh my gosh, you need to. And I, I say that because there's been a lot of times where people have asked that and I've been introduced to those people. Mm -hmm. And and when I meet somebody, and this isn't an ego thing, it's like I'm fascinated by how many people I met during Global Entrepreneurship yeah. Week that were like, are you Dave Berlin? 
four people have told me this week that I'm supposed to meet you. And then they tell me why. I'm surprised and I'm, it was only four. And I'm like, here, here's, here's who you need to call. Here's where you need to go. Here's what you need to do. And just amazing things starts to take shape from that. So That's fantastic. So where is Dave Berlin going to be? Uh, 2025, 2030, take your pick. 2025 is coming up pretty quick, so take your pick. But 2025 or 2030, where is Dave Berlin going to be? Yeah, 2025, it, it's funny that you mentioned that because I just started drafting this out the other day. Um, unfortunately, I've had my head down for the last 20 years. I have not traveled internationally at all since I was on deployment in uh, 2001, 2002. Um, I just hit the big season um, as of this recording next month, which will be May. Um, my son graduates high school, mm -hmm. and he's headed up to UNR, uh, University of Reno. Congratulations. And that means empty nest. So for the first time, I really started to look at and say, what does that mean for me? Now, I can say this. Vegas will always be the global headquarters for me because mm -hmm. it has such a global reach to everywhere. There's always a piece of home back in Oklahoma. But... Um, I, I saw something and it just, it caught my attention. And then I just kind of followed that idea. And it's like, you know, what would be fun is to take everything that I've learned in the world of DJing weddings mm -hmm. and take that, um, on cruise lines. And, and I've been looking at the idea of getting certified as a yoga instructor for, through a veteran program, uh, that certifies veterans to learn how to do yoga. That's my best bilingual. I don't speak any other languages, but if I could be a DJ or teach yoga, I feel like I'd be pretty attractive on, on some cruise lines to uh, set sail um, after I lock in some pretty strong strategic partnerships and things where I'm always going to have that entre entrepreneurial mindset. Uh, but it could be a way that I can go and, and take kind of everything that I've learned from more than 500 dance floors across the United States. Uh, and pocket that on on some cruise lines for a minute. Sounds like we need to build a succession strategy for yep. for your companies <laughs> before you go do that. I bet we could. I bet I, we could. I know we could. <laughs> so what are the challenges that you're going to have to overcome besides a succession strategy yeah. to be able to go do that? Well, number one, I need to get a passport. <laughs> so that's... Dave. Yeah, I don't have that because I haven't traveled in 20 years. Uh, but no, um, there's, there's a few things. One is... Uh, you know, definitely a succession strategy makes sense because I think uh, there's still going to be a part of me that is always going to want to serve other people. Um, that's it's, it's a balance, right? So I can go do that and have a great time and make money and, and probably not have to pay rent because I live on the boat or whatever. But at the same time, that's that's only going to go so far. So it's really going to be a way to figure out what is the thing that I can be most intentional about and really build a strong, strong program there. And I've got, I've got a few ideas of what that That's might look awesome. like. That's awesome. That's awesome. So you're clearly excited about a lot of things. That's yeah. one of the questions I usually ask is, what are you excited about? But yeah. Dave Berlin is clearly excited about many, <laughs> yeah. many things. But what I also like to ask our guests is, what are you nervous about? What, what keeps you up at night, whether it's with the business, with the other efforts you have going on? What, what makes you anxious? Yeah, the, the interesting thing there is, the abundance of opportunity that I have. Um, I think I've always raised my hand for a lot of things. Um, I see something that I, I think I could be good at or something that I think is gonna help other people and I raise my hand and sometimes I've, I've done that too many times. What's been interesting now is I have a lot of opportunities that are coming to me and where normally it's like if it's not if it doesn't have an entrepreneurial thing, if it doesn't have community building, mm -hmm. if it doesn't have live events and it doesn't have veteran, like, I'm not going to do it at all. But what's really interesting, I'm starting to get some of these things that are like all of those or two of those things that I really care about that are like, here's a perfect little package of something that you would be awesome at. It's veterans and entrepreneurship or it's veterans and sales or whatever. Um, so, it's actually, it's where I'm nervous about it is that if I say yes to anything else, mm -hmm. more than ever, I feel like it is saying no to something else. And I yeah. have to be very careful uh, in where I commit and spend my energy. I, I think that's a reasonable thing to, to have a little anxiety about is what yeah. do I have to say no to so I can really give myself fully to, to saying yes to things. Yep. So besides Mike Kim, 
Mm -hmm. Who is a leader or someone in business that you really admire? There's, there's two. Um, I didn't mention David Meltzer earlier. Um, he's been a phenomenal um, mentor and coach for me this year. I, I raised my hand and jumped into his group coaching program, and I have kind of a direct line where I can ask him some of the bigger, harder questions that I don't feel um, I, can, I can't go to everyone with some of these questions. Um, he's been somebody who's phenomenal. And what I love about him is he's very intentional about creating strong partnerships uh, mm -hmm. for people that don't know. He uh, is basically like, I could say he's like the real life Jerry Maguire. Like he was really big in the world of sports. Um, and he took some really big risks in that world uh, that gave him a really strong reputation. Um, but he's really good about saying, hey, put yourself in the middle of every introduction, like formally. And I, I'm glad I said yes, because like I'd already introduced him to like five really big people. <laughs> and now it's like, I want to learn how to take that step and, and put myself in the middle of some of brokering some of those deals. So he's been phenomenal. Um, and then somebody that I just, I haven't even started to talk about yet. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been kind of a secret project that was, I felt like it was kind of like behind the curtain. Breaking uh, news. Breaking news. Uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Mike Bausch who you said pizza earlier, mm -hmm. and I said Andalini's. Um, Mike Bausch is one of the, I, I say he's one of the top five people in the entire world of pizza right now. Um, he's keynote speaker at the big International Pizza Expo. Um, we started, I've known him for several years because mm -hmm. we met in the wedding industry. He wrote a book uh, called Unsliced, and he didn't just write a book. I mean, he, he had it published with like Tucker Max and all those guys. Mm -hmm. He wanted to be right there at the same table as everybody else, but his book, um, is all about the restaurant industry. He has five pizzerias, three gelaterias, two bagel shops. He has a storefront that they own in the airport in Tulsa that's a slice house and a gelateria. Mm -hmm. He has fine dining, a uh, food truck, and a full catering business. And now he started going around kind of like a John Taffer, like the mm -hmm. bar rescue guy. Yeah. Um, and he's created the unsliced um, restaurant system that he sees gaps in stuff like traction and EOS that d don't directly apply to that industry. Mm -hmm. And we're working on this whole system. So we launched it at Pizza Expo this year. Um, I took the role of integrator because mm -hmm. I, I wanted to learn how to build the website. I know funnels, I know sales, but this is the first deadline that we had. And we had it up and running by Expo. We had you know people into the group coaching program and we're already booking people one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, so I'm really fascinated to run with him. Um, I get to sit at the table with a lot of great people like that, but it's one of the first people I've got to work with in a long time that had projects and deadlines and profit and, and all these things. And it's just reignited that whole energy for me. Um, and it's something that I'm working on a couple hours a week, but it, it keeps me uh, going and everything else. That's that exciting. Yeah. All right. Before we get into the final couple questions, is there anything else you want us to know about Dave Berlin or anything you're working on? Um, one thing that I still have on many of my titles across social media is podcast host. Mm -hmm. Um, I did do uh, a podcast during COVID. I was able to pin down some of my favorite people that have inspired me. Some of the authors and speakers and mentors that I've worked with over the years. I think I did about 25 episodes. Um, it, I put it on the shelf after live events and stuff started opening back up here. I felt it was kind of hard to do both. Mm -hmm but with so many things that have come back full circle and so many incredible relationships that I've made, it's time to fire that back up. So the Dave Means Business Podcast will be coming uh, to a, a platform near you in the very future. Can't wait, we'll be looking for it. So tell us where everyone can reach you. Yep, um, branding and all that stuff is always kind of in, in flow and, and, and being revised. Uh, but you can always find me. Uh, I'm the only Dave Berlin on Instagram. All the social media handles is just my name. Mm -hmm. uh, but also uh, DaveMeansBusiness.com is a, an easy link tree to some of the stuff that I'm working on right now. Awesome. Is there anyone, something or someone you are, you are grateful for? Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll throw this back on Mike Kim because he taught me a three prompt uh gratitude that you can use every day that's not the same thing every mm -hmm. day it's a person in your life it's a uh opportunity that you have and something that happened yesterday 
Um, so as far as a person in my life, um, I've had this amazing, incredible friend who has been uh, kind of a right hand person, uh, always there helping out with all the projects and stuff I've been doing for the last two years. Her name's Sophia. <laughs> she's uh, Sophia Monroe with Daymaker Productions. I, I think I've heard of her. Pretty remarkable. Very grateful for her. And finally, if you could give advice to young people or even go back in time and give some advice to young Dave mm -hmm. at any point along the way, do you have any advice for, for young people or for young Dave along the way? I do. Read. Uh, one of those little simple things I found is uh, if you want to understand the world, read. If you want to understand yourself, write. And um, I can say this, I, the first book that I really read that ever like made sense to me, I cheated on all my book reports. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just, a, I always cheated. Like I read, uh, what was it? Uh, Sphere, which was also a movie. I read Jurassic Park, which was also a movie. Uh, so, but I didn't read my first book until I was 30. And it's when I joined the, the DJ company. Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, 12 years ago. And I can't breathe without books. Uh, there's always something. And if I, I can't even imagine what I would be or where I would be if I was consuming books at that level when I was 14, 15, 16 years old, even in the military, like where my headspace would be. Um, so now I can't, that, that's it. Read a book or listen to a book. Some people, when I say read books, oh, don't read books. Listen to one. I don't care. Uh, but just never stop learning. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for sharing so much of yourself. I think our audience is really going to love what you've had to say today and what you've shared. Thank you to Cooperate at Blackfire for letting us transform a little corner of their space into this fantastic studio. Thank you to you guys for doing that transformation, by the way. And thank you all for joining us for some conversation with Dave. I'm Jason LaDuke from Evil Genius Leadership Consultants. The future is out there. Lead the way.